Yeah, you use words like home stretch when you're just trying to get people to stay in the room, but I think we've got the perfect speaker to get people to stay in the room, and I can assure you that your, uh, your advisor, Beth, has already done you proud in the preceding session. I don't think she made too much new policy, though obviously my uh, colleagues will be examining everything she said. Um, We've had an, I think, admirable mix of high-blown rhetoric and very existential discussion today, but also concrete specifics. And I, I hope that um, we're all fine with sort of continuing that with this session, because obviously your life is a lot about concrete specifics and ongoing uh, arrangements, as well as the big picture, which I know we'll get to. So that I will ask you a little bit about some of the sort of things in your in-tray, but I think that could also lead us quite nicely into some of these broader discussions. So I guess the obvious one to start with is the Trump-era Section 301 tariffs on China. You've been reviewing the necessity of those for a year. Have you decided? Well, uh, it's wonderful to see you, Stephanie, and it's uh, delightful to be with all of you. And I know that uh, I was looking at the schedule, and I think you and I, and maybe a short closing session, are what separates uh, the audience from a reception and beverages. So it's always uh, um, a tough place to be in the agenda. But um, uh, to start with your question, um, a year ago, under our statute, um, we were uh, asked to begin a process to evaluate not the necessity of the tariffs, but the effectiveness of the tariffs. It's important to be really specific about the statutory requirements because uh, um, we've got to follow the law. And so uh, we began that um, just about a year ago. We are engaging in a very robust uh, interagency process. Uh, we requested comments from the public across our economy uh, we had an open uh, public uh, comment period that closed earlier this year, that generated um, about 1,500 comments that uh, we are going through very carefully. Uh, I've been asked, um, we call it the four-year review, I've been asked whether uh, that's because it will last four years. The answer is no, it's the four-year review because it, it happened, it was triggered at the four-year mark of the tariffs. Um, I want to uh, convey uh, to uh, the audience and to uh, all who are interested in this uh, that the Biden administration takes the management of the U.S.-China relationship extremely seriously. It is one of our most uh, profound responsibilities in terms of managing not just our economy, but the world economy in terms of how we are relating to each other, the two largest economies in the world. And so uh, we are um, making sure to take our time to be very deliberate and to be extremely thoughtful about um, how we can rebalance the trading relationship between these two largest economies in the world um, to achieve more fairness and uh, to achieve more effectiveness in um, defending our economic interests. And I think at the core of this exercise, uh, is a recognition that uh, the U.S. and the Chinese economies for their size and their uh, weight and significance in the world economy, that we're two economies that are very structurally different, that are based on very different uh, philosophical uh, underpinnings. And so the issue of how we can achieve a... Um, coexistence that can be productive and constructive for the world is not an easy question, and I don't think the answers are easy either. But in terms of this particular tariff review, it is a part of the larger exercise that we are bringing to the management of this relationship. But I mean, as you pointed out, you've been, you, you closed the, the comments period uh, in January, so I guess that's eight months. I mean, can we expect um, any action on this you know, in the, in the nearish future, or is this something that's going to push a long way ahead. Well, our goal is to um, wrap this up, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Okay. Um, and you talked about the broader relationship. We've ob we obviously also measure the relationship in part, maybe we shouldn't, but by visits and shakings of hands and meetings. We've had uh, Secretary Raimondo and others from the administration have now been to China. Um, 
Do, are you expecting to go to China in the near future? How do, you, how do you see the relationship at that level, the sort of personal relationship? So I'll go back to the way you framed your question because I think it was quite telling uh, whether or not we should be measuring the relationship in terms of the numbers of visits or who's going where. I think that the, um, what, what we're trying to get at and the most important element is uh, whether or not we are communicating. Um, and uh, given the challenges between us, uh, whether or not we are able to uh, promote a better understanding of each other. So I think it's less about the act of visiting and more about um, the substance of the engagement. And, and on that, um, I have from the very beginning of my time uh, indicated and stood by uh, my openness to engage with uh, my counterparts in Beijing. Um, since the last uh, changeover in um, uh, President Xi's team uh, last fall, uh, I've not yet had a chance to meet the new vice premier, uh, but uh, we have indicated through all of our channels an openness uh, and an eagerness uh, to meet to um, continue the process of uh, deepening the understanding between us, especially around the areas where our economies um, are uh, encountering friction and incompatibility. You probably need to seize your moment because the lineup might change any minute. It's been changing uh, every few months. Um, closer to home, your, your team reminded me when we were discussing this session that you're only a month away from the US and the EU potentially reimposing uh, tariffs on each other having not reached a deal on the clean steel talk. So could you just let us know briefly how, how those are going? Certainly, let me review the facts there a little bit too and a bit of the history. So when we uh, came in uh, in this administration at the beginning of 2021, uh, the transatlantic relationship um, was under quite a bit of stress. And uh, in response to the global steel and aluminum tariffs that had been applied in 2018, uh, Europe applied on um, a large amount of US trade going to Europe, retaliatory tariffs. Now, um, what we did in uh, October of 2021 uh, was to call a truce with Europe. Uh, we converted the tariffs to what we call tariff rate quotas. Uh, that allowed for us to resume duty-free trade in steel and aluminum from Europe with guardrails. Uh, if they hit certain limits that exceed historical quantities, um, tariffs outside of those volumes would, would kick back in. In the meantime, Europe suspended its retaliatory tariffs. Now, we programmed those um, uh, tariff actions on both sides uh, to expire um, uh, at the end of 2023, if we did not come up with a new arrangement between the US and the EU by the end of October. And that's the deadline that we're working towards. October 31, 2023, we gave ourselves two years to negotiate something where the US and the EU could put ourselves on um, a footing where we could be linking arms to take on the overall challenge of overproduction, overcapacity in steel and aluminum in the global marketplace that is impacting our producers, our workers in similar ways because uh, we both have uh, what we consider to be market-based production, production that is uh, exposed to market forces, that is responding to market forces like demand. Uh, and that this overproduction in the global marketplace uh, is based on non-market forces. Um, so uh, we are nearing the deadline uh, and uh, we have been doing a lot of work in terms of aligning our systems. The two challenges that we are trying to solve for together on a US-EU basis are first, the global market distortions and the uh, negative impacts to our producers that come from non-market excess production and capacity, so unfair trade. The other challenge that we are uh, linking arms to address is uh, the need for a clean energy and industrial future. And so the other pieces of what we've been doing is trying to figure out how to align uh, our markets to create incentives for cleaner production. 
uh, if you are producing as cleanly as we are based on our metrics and our uh, data, then uh, the concept is that uh, you will have um, easier access into our markets. This is creating incentives for clean trade and clean production. The more fairly you are producing your steel and aluminum, again, the more we treat you the way that we will be treating each other. And uh, this is the basis for what we've been um, working towards, uh, what we've been calling a global sustainable steel and aluminum arrangement. So that our vision is that once the US and the EU can agree, that we then bring in other like-minded parties and we try to create a paradigm, to your point about changing the paradigms of trade, we try to create a paradigm for trade that is going to raise standards over time, that is going to incentivize fair production and fair trade based on market principles and also clean production and clean trade. Uh, so this is one of the most consequential uh, engagements and negotiations that we are engaged in. Uh, one of the most important between the US and the EU. And uh, I remain uh, very hopeful that we will have something to show uh, the rest of the world uh, in the next six week period. Are you sort of dead set on introducing a tariff, even if it's unilateral, on what you might call dirty steel? Uh, a sort of US version of the carbon border adjustment mechanism? Because that, as you've, you've highlighted, that that sort of mechanism would be p part of the deal you're looking for, but it goes beyond Europe. So i uh, just push back a little bit on the way you framed your question, am I dead set? <laughs> um, I am very determined for the United States to be able to work with the EU as partners jointly to address the challenges that we face in the changing global economic situation. And those have to do with fair trade, market-based production, and also carbon intensity. So let me just bring it back down to the principles of what we're trying to accomplish. And yes, we are very, very committed to being able to do this with Europe. The way that you've wanted to do it, and I think the, the, the issue has been for the EU, and I think, um, uh, Vice President Dombrovskis have made it clear, is that what you are looking for seems to go against WTO rules because you would be discriminating against a certain number of countries and you don't have a similar mechanism that the EU has um, for that it applies to its own companies. So I think this gets us to one of the discussions that we've had all through the day. There's a sort of disquiet in Europe with... Uh, a US policy which seems to undermine the concept of a global rule-based order. Uh, and I just, there's even a, a feeling that you can't do all the things that you're talking about within the WTO or even within the spirit of the WTO. Is that fair? That's absolutely not fair, and you know that <laughs> I'm going to say that. Uh, so thank you well, for that. Tell us why and not. I I appreciate the opportunity to explain the U.S. point of view because I know that uh, Brussels has been very effective in um, transmitting uh, its, its side of the story. Uh, and do keep in mind that we are still at the table uh, negotiating constructively um, so that uh, you know, the public versions of what you're hearing is, uh, is for a public audience. But uh, we have a very good partnership uh, still in terms of um, the negotiations themselves. What I want to really um, emphasize is uh, I really bristle at um, this narrative that the United States would put forward a proposal uh, that is uh, WTO inconsistent because that calls into question uh, our good faith in engagement and our good faith as a WTO member. Um, let me put it to you this way, because I think that um, we talk a lot about the WTO, and many people talk about the WTO. Not a lot of people um, have uh, uh, been to the WTO, participated at the WTO, or represented their governments at the WTO. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there is no WTO rabbi who sits and pronounces whether or not a measure that is being advanced by a WTO mem member is kosher or not. I think that when we put forward measures, we all try to ensure that we are working within the rules-based order. In fact, I know that the Europeans are very, very proud of their carbon border adjustment mechanism and that, that it is the culmination of a lot of European-based work and compromise and negotiations. 
I also want to uh, acknowledge and recognize that um, Europe's confidence that the CBAM is WTO consistent, is indicative of the work that Europe has put in um, to, um, uh, to design the system, and Europe's confidence in terms of how it will defend the CBAM if challenged at the WTO. And we all know that there are members of the WTO right now who are looking and preparing to challenge the CBAM at the WTO. So whether or not you feel confident about the work you've done to design your system doesn't mean that it's not going to be challenged or you wouldn't have to defend it. And so I give you that background because I want to emphasize and make clear that the proposals that we have put on the table and shared with Brussels are ones that we also feel we have designed to withstand WTO scrutiny, that we have our reasons for believing that we have uh, abided by the WTO rules. At the end of the day, in our negotiations, it became very clear that um, our um, uh, levels of tolerance or our comfort level with different types of uh, defenses are different on a Washington and Brussels basis, and that's very natural. Um, we have adapted in the negotiations, as you must in negotiations, to try to um, come towards Europe in terms of its uh, WTO argumentation and defense comfort. And uh, I want to make sure to share that with all of you because that is something that we do not get credit for, that I want you to know that we don't just sit at a negotiating table and pound the table and say, you must do this because we do know how to negotiate, we have successfully negotiated agreements with the EU, and we do intend to land this negotiation on a Washington-Brussels basis and soon. Well, you've made me wish even more that I was in the room in some of these negotiations, because it must be really good fun being in negotiation with you. Um, I'm sure if there, if, there was actually, if there was actually a WTO rabbi, I'm fairly sure that the Transatlantic Council would have somehow got them on the stage here, uh, but, uh, but uh, unfortunately there isn't. Um, I can't help asking, given what you've just said, changing the subject a little, was what was your response when you heard, probably a fair bit ahead of the rest of us, that the EU was going to launch its probe into the subsidies of Chinese electrical vehicles, given how much high-blown rhetoric we have heard from the European Union on free trade and other things? What was my response? Um, I don't know. I think um, I don't well, what do you know think that about I heard it? it. I don't know that I heard it much in advance of everyone else. Um, I'm quite sympathetic to um, the announcement, really, because at the end of the day, as a policymaker, an economic policymaker, um, in a democracy, your responsibility is to the livelihoods of your citizens and your workers and your ability to grow your industries. This is true for us in the United States. It's true for Europe. I know you've got a more um, uh, uh, complicated structure in terms of the, the member states and uh, the commission. Um, but if you look at the facts and you look at the data on the ground and you look at um, the electric vehicle industry and the competition, uh, and you look at how this industry has grown in China, it. Um, it is, uh, it is echoing uh, all of the dynamics that we have seen from industry to industry that uh, where we have been under incredible pressure to continue to compete from our standpoint of having market-based economies. And it underpins the dynamics that we have with steel and aluminum that have led us to a point where we were launching tariffs against each other before we could try to figure out a, a, a place and an opportunity to, on how we work together on a challenge that is uh, uh, putting pressure on both of us. Uh, we have experienced it with solar panels where 20 years ago, we both, the US, the EU, also Canada, had burgeoning solar production industries that we have all mostly lost, by the way. And uh, we see the same thing happening with electric vehicles. Um, so I think that um, uh, what I see is 
in so many ways, and this is one of the ways in which the EU is waking up to the fact that global trade today is not happening on a level playing field. And therefore, there are things that we market-based democratic economies need to do in order to defend, to defend our interests and to defend the space to have fair and free trade. And I think that that is one of the most important aspects of this uh, coming to terms with today's global realities is um, so many things have happened in these past couple years, whether it's um, uh, the supply chain shocks that came from the pandemic and the discombobulation of uh, the shipping and the logistics around supply chains to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, I just want to recall that not even that many years ago, the accepted wisdom was two countries that had McDonald's would never go to war with each other. But just a year and a half ago, we saw that um, despite the fact that there had been many McDonald's in Russia and in Ukraine, that that didn't stop Vladimir Putin from making the decision to invade Ukraine. And so for many, many reasons, <clears throat> it is incumbent on us, especially on a transatlantic basis, but across the world to open our eyes and to look at how the world trading system is functioning. Compare the reality that we are experiencing today to the foundational goals that we set out for ourselves 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago and try to figure out how we can um, accomplish what I believe are still valid and legitimate goals from a long time ago, but to correct for the distortions and the, um, uh, uh, the losing our way uh, that has happened over time. And this also gives me an opportunity, uh, Stephanie, I hope you'll indulge me to, um, uh, to pitch my uh, speech on uh, WTO reform and my remarks with uh, Director General Ngozi a little bit later today here in Washington. Okay, heard it here first. Um, just very briefly on that, just on the, because I'm trying to tease out where we're going on this. If, if you have a finding from the EU against China and it ends up in quite a costly amount of retaliation, tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, retaliation by China, which obviously many in Germany are, are fearful of, does that serve the, serve the kind of objectives that you're seeking when you talk about trying to build a sort of fairer global trading system to have that kind of all-out trade dispute? Well, let me unpack your question, um, because uh, uh, let's, let's be very clear. The countervailing duty investigation and potentially uh, countervailing duty actions um, are allowed expressly under WTO rules. The WTO recognizes that not all trade is fair necessarily, and we are allowed trade defense instruments that are, as you call them in the EU, and what we call trade remedies. All WTO members are allowed trade remedies to correct for unfair trade, whether it takes the form of dumping, uh, illegal subsidies, or when they are combined. Uh, they can be very harmful to your uh, industrial and your, uh, uh, and your uh, worker and societal growth. Um, so, from where I sit, in terms of tracking the announcements from the EU, the EU is well within its rights, as we all are, to launch a countervailing duty investigation. I think I did hear a bit of uh, Denis' um, interventions earlier. Uh, they will have to allow those investigations to run. And then based on the findings of those investigations, if they do apply countervailing duties, they will be calculated to address the unfairness and the, the gap in terms of the harm. Uh, and should there be retaliation, that retaliation should be based in WTO rules or that retaliation is illegal. And I, I also heard Demi talk about economic coercion, so I think it's not wrong to anticipate that there may be uh, economic consequences that are inflicted, but just to reflect again that that is not the way that the world trading rules are supposed to work. 
So I appreciate your question because I think that it really highlights some of the fundamental values that are baked into the World Trade Organization and, and how far our reality has uh, deviated from uh, the way that we try to design the system. I want to tick off a couple more things because you said um, that the emphasis, you, you've been said in, in numerous speeches, the emphasis of, of your um, policy at the moment and what you consider to be your job is not ticking off trade agreements, reducing tariffs, but a much broader concept of, of resilience in, our, in, in, in trade relations and broader relationships. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework was one uh, example of that about a year ago started the, started the negotiations on that. I just, can we expect to see something at the APEC meeting? I'm just wondering how that's, how that's going. No, I think you absolutely should expect to see. Um, uh, we, are, we are looking forward to, uh, again, unveiling and demonstrating the progress that we've accomplished um, in this uh, 14 uh, country group. Um, uh, about half the size of the EU. We're not trying to accomplish the same things as the EU, but just to just to demonstrate that uh, uh, it's a it's a multi-party cooperative uh, effort that we have gotten underway. Um, the entire uh, framework um, uh, effort was launched by our leaders in May of 2022. That's just over a year ago. Um, we just hit and just passed our one-year anniversary of convening uh, the first uh, meeting of um, economic and trade ministers. Uh, we did that in September of 22, at the beginning of September, in Los Angeles. And uh, in just the last uh, 12 months, and by November it will be 14 months, um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing with everyone what we've accomplished, keeping in mind uh, how challenging multi-party uh, uh, exercises are, um, and um, uh, that in the world of trade negotiations in particular, um, 12 to 14 months is a very short amount of time. And I think uh, I would very much um, uh, look forward to uh, demonstrating how much we have done in a very short period of time. It is more than just showing off. <laughs> uh, and, and there's a trade pillar? Have, demonstrating how quickly we need to find ways to collaborate, to come together, to innovate together in a global economy where changes are not waiting for massive single undertakings and years-long trade negotiations, that what we are doing is finding ways to work together with like-minded partners to figure out how we can unlock and use the tools of uh, trade uh, and economic principles to promote not just resilience, I know that there's a huge, huge focus on resilience, um, but also sustainability and equally importantly, inclusivity in the outcomes of our economic cooperation. Because all of those are dynamics uh, and challenges that we all face in the current global economic climate. And there's a trade pillar to that. There are four pillars. Yes, there's a but trade how's pillar, the trade pillar going? The supply chain <laughs> pillar that's going well. We're making a lot of progress. OK. Um, we got a couple of minutes for, for a question. I know that they might well be a question in the audience. Um, I don't have the iPad, so I can't get the questions from outside, but I didn't get any this morning, so... Does anyone have a question for the ambassador? I will ask you... Oh, yes. Do you want... Uh, okay, we'll just wait for the mic. Hi, Noah Birkin from Rhodium Group and German Marshall Fund. Um, I'm, I'm just curious for your thoughts, uh, um, Ms. Tai, on the TTC uh, and the future of the TTC. How is it going? Uh, do you see a bright future for it? The changes need to be made. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's wonderful. It would be, uh, it would be wrong to wrap this up without talking about the TTC, so I'm very glad for that prompt. Um, we are uh, looking to host uh, TTC5 sometime this fall. Uh, I'm also looking forward to that. I think, um, you know, uh, trade negotiators and, uh, um, uh, you know, demanding bosses, uh, we like to be critical about how we can do things better. But I think that um, the TTC has been uh, incredibly successful and it's incredibly valuable. Uh, we set this up, um, uh, President Biden and President von der Leyen announced the, um, uh, uh, the start of the TTC effort in June of 2021. 
um, and we uh, we hosted our first TTC in Pittsburgh um, almost exactly two years ago. Um, when we set it up, it was really uh, to create a forum for collaboration, cooperation, uh, incubation and innovation of new uh, ideas to address um, how we can align better in uh, responding to uh, trade and technology challenges uh, that we are facing. Um, it was, uh, I think the value of the TTC was demonstrated very, very clearly when Russia invaded Ukraine. And this structure of uh, communication, the relationships that we had built through uh, the TTC, and I think at that point we'd only met um, once, um, <clears throat> immediately facilitated uh, the ability for the US and the EU to coordinate responses uh, on the economic side to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And ever since then, I think that the robust work that's happening across 10 working groups, uh, could it be streamlined? Um, possibly, can we improve it? I'm sure, um, but uh, I'm really delighted uh, and looking forward to hosting the next TTC because I think that um, it's already demonstrated its value and um, uh, with all of the challenges that we continue to face, uh, I expect it to continue to uh, serve um, a, a great deal of our transatlantic interests. Just a final question, Ambassador, before, before we let you go. I was very struck, one of your predecessors, Michael Froman, said to me earlier this year in an, in an interview that, you know, looking back on the, when China joined the WTO, that we had this anticipation that China would become more like us, and instead we have become more like them. Um, focus on subsidies, playing one country against another, uh, state-directed state investments in different sectors. Do you think that's a fair observation? Well, uh, Mike Froman is a good friend of mine, um, and I think that to one of the benefits of not being U.S. Trade Representative anymore, and perhaps uh, he was in his uh, CFR um, uh, um, identity when you have the chance to talk to him. Um, I don't think that's fair. Uh, in particular, uh, the second part that we are becoming more like China. Um, I think, uh, again, you have to recognize that uh, the global economy, the terms of competition have changed and we need to adapt. We're not trying to embrace the Chinese model. We're trying to embrace a model that uh, stays true to our market orientation, to our democratic principles that is going to allow us to compete in a global economy that is very, very different, truly, than it was uh, just 20 short years ago. And um, uh, we're doing it on an EU and US basis. Um, the key is that uh, we have to stay true to our principles because at the end of the day, uh, what we value most uh, is um, our democratic freedoms and, frankly, our economic freedoms and our opportunities. And uh, that is something that underlies everything that we are doing today, and that hasn't changed. Ambassador Catherine Tai, thank you very much.